All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. That's right. That's what we celebrate this morning. We're going to open the scriptures and we're going to look at the reason for Easter and the reason that we gather together and have a specific and special celebration this morning. So I'm actually going to have you open to two places in the Bible. I did this last week as well as this week, so apologies for that. Sorry for the paper cuts. But first, uh, please open to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. That's Luke 24, verses 1 through 7. And then the second place is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. So that's Luke 24, 1 through 7, and Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. While you're turning there, let me kind of orient us a, a little bit to this series that we've been in for the past three weeks and that we're going to be capping off today entitled Jesus, Prophet, Priest, and King. We've been exploring what uh, are often called the offices of Christ. And a helpful way to think about this is these are like bullet points on Jesus' job description, specific ways in which He carries out God's mission of salvation. In week one, we saw that Jesus is the great prophet and that we are called to be His prophetic people Last week, we looked at how Jesus is our great high priest. He brings us to God, and we are his priestly people who bring others to Jesus. And today, we're going to see and celebrate that Jesus is our King. So I invite you, please, to stand for the reading of God's Word. I'll read for us, I'll pray, and then we will dive in. Luke 24, beginning in verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the, from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Flip over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray and ask that you would guide us in it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate, to celebrate Jesus' resurrection, to celebrate that death doesn't have the last word, and to meditate on what your scriptures say about all the implications, the beautiful, powerful, profound implications of Jesus' resurrection. God, would you send your Holy Spirit right now to lead and guide us into the truth just as you promised that you would? Open the eyes of our heart so that we might know the hope to which we are called. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We read two passages. In the first one, we were given the facts about Jesus' resurrection, and in the second one, we're told its spiritual perspective. In the first one, we're told who was there, what they saw, and how it occurred. In the second one, uh, the Apostle Paul zooms out to the, not even the 60,000 foot level, to the, like, in space level, to tell us about the unseen significance about what God was doing through Jesus' resurrection. And what we discover is quite profound, that Jesus' resurrection was actually His coronation. 
It was his enthronement as king. And we need to see what that means for our lives. If you forget anything else this morning, here's what I want us to remember and to celebrate and to think about. God, excuse me, Jesus was raised to be your king. Jesus was raised to be your king. Simple. Simply put, Jesus was raised to be your king. Now, before we talk about the implications, let's talk about this account that the gospel writer Luke gives us about the resurrection of Jesus. And what we're going to see is that he's writing history. He tells us who was there. And time and again, throughout these final chapters of his gospel account, he goes to great lengths to tell us that these were real people. The same women who saw the empty tomb were the ones who saw him die on the cross, who saw him laid in that tomb, and who saw the tomb sealed. And then they came back on Sunday morning and they saw it empty. And then later, Luke is going to tell us that Jesus, the risen Jesus, encounters two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he tells us their names. Then he tells us that Jesus encounters Peter. And then later, that he shows up in a room where all of his disciples are, and he says, hey, have a look at the nail holes in my hands and in my feet. Luke isn't telling us that Jesus rose in some mythical, phantom-like fashion. No, he really was raised. He really rose from the dead. My favorite account in the final chap- chapter of Luke is when Jesus shows up among them and he says, do you have any fish? And they give him a piece of fish and he eats the fish in front of them. The idea is I'm not a ghost, I'm not a phantom, I'm really here, real body, real taste buds, real stomach, and yet raised to new life. Jesus was really raised. Now, coming in this morning, I'm not sure what you thought about the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe you thought, oh, that's a fun myth. But it's not a myth. The claim of the scriptures is that Jesus was raised with a real flesh and bone body, though it was transformed by the resurrection. But that's the claim nonetheless. And you you might say to me, dead people don't rise from the dead. Agreed. That's what makes this so extraordinary. It's what makes it a miracle. It's what makes it the miracle around which the Christian faith is formed. This is something that makes the Christian faith distinct. Is that it's based in fact. It's based in history. It's based on eyewitness accounts that there was this man who told them, hey, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. He's going to be crucified and on the third day rise again. And then he did it. And he was seen by more than 500 people at one time. Jesus was really, actually raised. If that's all we had, however, we might conclude that God just did an amazing magic trick, that that was a big old rabbit pulled out of that hat. But because we have the rest of Scripture, we know that that's not simply the case. Jesus was raised, as Paul will tell us, to be your king. So flip over to Philippians chapter 2, in which Paul is going to tell us The spiritual unseen significance. What is going on in the unseen world as Jesus was raised from the dead? Beginning in verse 9, he says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Jesus' resurrection, in that moment, God was bestowing something on him. And we're told it's a name, but we're not told what the name is until the very end. I like Paul. Paul's like a, you know, like one of those movie trailers that doesn't give much away. Paul often writes like that. He keeps the main punchline until the very, very end. But he tells us something about this name. He says, God bestowed, so he highly exalted him, and he bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So we don't want to know what the name is, but we do know that it's above every other name. Now, what's the deal with this name above every other name? I was thinking about a way to illustrate this, and an example came to mind from my own life. So I have two small kids, um, getting bigger every day, and one of my kids was in their room, and I was in there doing what parents do, picking stuff up, arranging things, putting stuff back. If you're a parent, you know how that goes. And um, I was giving 
my child instructions because it was about to be dinner time and they need to do this, this or that. And my child said this to me, you need to get out of my room. It's like, whew, okay. Full disclosure, I would like to pretend like I held it together and like did really well in that moment. That was not the case. I lost my temper and I had to go back and apologize later. But here's what I would have done had I been more led by God's Spirit at that point. Um, I would have sat my child down and explained to them, this is your room, yes, but there is a name above your name, (laughs) namely, your mom and me. Why? Because our name is on the mortgage agreement. (laughs) This might be your room. But this is our house. And I was thinking about that and I was like, wait, also there's a name above our name, the bank that lent us the money to buy this house. I wish I owned it outright now, but there's a name above our name that uh, imparts certain rights to that bank. That's what it means for a name to be above a name. It's talking about position, it's talking about authority, it's talking about power. But God has bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every other name, which means there is nobody who can claim greater authority than Jesus. There's actually nobody who can say to Jesus, get out of my room, this is my room and mine alone. Whatever, it might be your room, but the house is God's. Oh, the land is God's. Oh, the block is God's. Oh, the neighborhood belongs to Jesus. You you get the point. The name above every other name. Jesus was raised to be your king. So what does this require of people? So he exalted him, bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that, purpose statement. When you're reading the Bible and you see the term, so that, here we're going to learn the implications, what is required of people in response to what God has done. So that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Now, uh, we don't really live in a culture here in the United States where we bow all that often. Even when we meet those in the highest office in our nation, we we don't even bow. We shake hands. We say, Mr. President. Um, Maybe you come from a culture that bows. So you might have a little bit of a better understanding. But We need to understand what bowing means. If every knee shall bow and is meant to bow to the name of Jesus, we ought to know what bowing means, right? So New Testament scholar Walter Hansen says this, Bowing the knee expresses supplication, abasement, worship, subjection before one in authority. It is a visual representation an acknowledgement of somebody who is in authority, in power, over you. The purpose in God bestowing the, the name above all names upon Jesus is so that every knee should bow, every knee should, have, should assume a posture of submission and worship to Jesus. Now what does this include? Paul tells us. So that every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth. This was an ancient saying that basically says all creation. All creation. In the ancient cosmic imagination, there was this firmament, which was kind of like an umbrella, above the sky, and then you had the sky, and then you had the earth, and then you had the place of the dead shield under the earth. So as an expression to say everything in all creation, seen and unseen, because it was believed that the unseen spirits dwelt in the space between the firmament and the earth. So when Paul invokes this saying, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, it means every created thing, all creation, full scope. What, what, why did God bestow on Jesus the name above every name? So that er, so, uh, full Global submission to King Jesus. Jesus was raised to be your king. What else? And that every tongue should confess, and then we're going to get the name. We finally get the name. That Jesus is Lord. 
to the glory of God the Father. What name has God bestowed on Jesus so that every knee should bow? Lord. Now, Lord is so rich and multifaceted, but it means at least two things. Here's the first one. It means Jesus is God. In the Old Testament, when you're reading your Bible, you'll see that God is referred to as Lord. It's the same, it's the same translational links that are happening here. When Paul reaches for that term in Greek, kyrios, that same term is used to denote God throughout the Old Testament. It's, he's making a claim that Jesus is God. He's the God of Israel. Now, why, why does this enable Jesus to be the one to whom everybody and everything is subjected? If Jesus is connected here with Yahweh, it's because Yahweh is the creator God. This right here is what designates the God of Israel as separate from every other deity, every other created thing, because only about Yahweh can it be said that He is creator. Everything else is creation. You and I, creation, as big as your bedroom might be, that is your bedroom, creation is God's. And Jesus, therefore, is equated with Yahweh of the Scriptures, Jesus holds all authority and is involved in creation, and therefore, it is said about him the same thing that is said about God. It says this, like here, here's how we know that this connection is just my, not my good idea. Paul is actually quoting exact language from the book of Isaiah, and here's what he says. This is Isaiah 45, verse 23 and 24. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah to his people. So, so these quotes are God's voice. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Sound familiar? Only in the Lord it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. To him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. Paul, who knows this prophecy from the book of Isaiah says, you know that promise that everybody is going to come and bow the knee in subjection to Yahweh? That is the name that God has bestowed upon Jesus. So every knee shall come and bow to God in Jesus. That's a claim about who Jesus is. It's also a claim about who isn't Lord. This comes from the book of Philippians. It was a letter written to Christians in a city called Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony. Rome wasn't just a political system, it was an imperial cult. It was believed that Jupiter and the Roman pantheon had bestowed upon Augustus Caesar the divine right to rule. He received his authority from the Roman gods. And the way that you would show your allegiance to the Roman imperial cult was with a specific phrase, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. It was saying all authority throughout the entire world is all under the umbrella of one person, Caesar. And Christians, their declaration, their confession is, no, Jesus is Lord. Now, in our day and age, we don't bow the knee to Caesar. But I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we thought we didn't bow our knee to any other Lord. In our day, day, day and age, it's actually the sovereign self. You don't tend to bow our knee to a political system or a king here or a queen there. We tend to bow our knee to ourself and say, I'm in charge of my life. I have authority over my life. Nobody else has claim over my life. And we're celebrated in doing that. Every commercial you watch, every movie that you see, every conversation you have is saying, yes, that's a good thing to say nobody should be able to tell me what to do. This is my bedroom. Mine. All the while failing to recognize that the house is God's. That the house belongs to Jesus. And any authority we have is only by a gift of His sheer grace. 
Jesus is Lord. And that means we are not. Jesus was raised to be your king. Are you in heaven or on earth or under the earth? And if you're not sure, come talk to me afterwards. We need to, there might be some bigger issues going on there. If you're a created thing, if you're on this earth, if you have breath in your lungs, if you're a human being, it means that Jesus was raised to be your king. And that means that you are not king over your life. You are not your own personal Caesar of your bedroom. Jesus was raised to be your king. Now, what are, what's at stake? I think this is a really important question. Because this all might sound, okay, I can see that in the text, that sounds interesting, but what if I don't want to? What if I say no? What if I say, you know what, I'm good to simply keep on saying, I am Lord over my life. What's at stake? Every knee shall bow, it shall bow. It's a future promise. Did you notice something interesting in the in the scripture we read from Isaiah. Emily, would you mind putting that back up? This is really interesting. The very last little bit of it says, To him shall come and be ashamed all who were incensed against him. The promise is not simply that those who don't want to bow to God simply stay where they are and like, okay, well, you don't have to bow. The promise is that every person from all creation and every nation will one day bow to King Jesus, whether you like it or not. And there will only be two groups of people at that point in the future in history, those who in this age and in this life joyfully, readily bowed the knee to King Jesus, joyfully, readily confessed with their mouths, yes, Jesus is Lord, willingly opened their, their, opened their mouths and let sound waves reverberate out of their throats. They said, yes, Jesus is Lord. This might be my bedroom, but the house is Jesus's. And then there will be those who come and bow and through gritted teeth admit that Jesus is in fact Lord. And the eternal destinies of those two groups couldn't be more stark. Eternal life for one, eternal death for the others. That's what's at stake. Jesus was raised to be your king. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. The question is whether you admit or whether you profess. And the difference is the choice you make in this age, in this life, about the confession you choose to make. Are you Lord or is Jesus Lord? You're thinking, wow, pastor, this is supposed to be Resurrection Sunday. Heavy. I love you too much not to tell you the truth. But how is submission good news? Because this is a weekend of good news. How is it good news that every knee shall bow to King Jesus? Because that doesn't sound like good news, especially to our modern ears. Submission is not a word that we're like, yes, submission. I love to submit. Excellent. How is it good news? <laughs> Let me put it to you like this. My goal in helping my child understand that, yes, the bedroom might belong to them, but the house belongs to us is to help them enjoy the entire house. And Jesus invites us to bow the knee and confess with the tongue because He wants us to share in all of the spoils of the war that He has won against death and hell and the grave. He invites us to share in His victory and in the, in the eternal life that he, that he procured through his death and his resurrection. He says, I want you to enjoy the whole house. Stop yelling at me about how the bedroom is yours. I want you to enjoy everything. I want eternal life for you. Life to the fullest. And as Jesus said to his disciples in the Gospel of John, he said, I have come so that their joy may be full. The only way we get true joy, true purpose, true eternal life here and now is by bowing the knee to King Jesus. 
Because he alone has defeated the grave. He alone has it to share with us. He's like, I got the entire house for you. Stop yelling about your bedroom. I got so much more for you. Submission is good news. Where do you find the power then to submit? We spent our entire time focusing on the last bit of this passage in Philippians chapter 2. But I believe it's the first half of Philippians chapter 2 that empowers you to do the second half. When it says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count it a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Pause there. The exalted king was first a humble servant. Serving how? Serving who? Serving you. He invites you to bow the knee and subject yourself to him as your king, but he first went to the cross in service of you. To the degree that you take to heart the truth of the gospel, which is that Jesus didn't come in pomp and circumstance, but came in humiliation. To the extent you do that, that's what empowers you to bow the knee to King Jesus. Because what else could it mean but that he loves you? When I sit my child down and I help, I help my child understand there's a name above your name. It's because I love my child. It's because I love my child. The reason God wants us to understand that Jesus has greater authority than us is because of what Jesus has done to first serve us. Now, I invite you to take out that survey card that Pastor Quentin had you. I, I thought I grabbed mine. John, would you mind pass, passing me one of those? He had you hold on to these. And here's why. These four boxes on the back, listed A, B, C, and D, all correspond to how you might stand in relation to King Jesus. And before we fill these out, I want you to realize before you check a box, you are a box. You are one of these boxes. And I think it's important, this is not about just giving us a card, it's about you understanding where you relate to King Jesus. And the A represents... That you are already, like Jesus is already my king. I've already bowed the knee to King Jesus. I've already invited him into my life through faith in the gospel and through what Jesus Christ has done. And I therefore stand, well, I therefore kneel as his subject. And I, Jesus shares with you all the spoils of his resurrection. There's this beautiful image at the end of Isaiah that we studied a few weeks back, of somebody coming back from war, having won and sharing the spoils with God's people. That's exactly what Jesus has done and is doing if your knee is bowed to King Jesus. And this morning is a time of celebration and of victory where you get to say, everything that Christ has won over, I get to stand in that victory. Death is defeated for me. Sin is defeated for me. And all these things that go along with death and sin and the grave, Christ has triumphed over for me. The checkbox B says, maybe I'm just beginning to submit to King Jesus. Or maybe I need to begin again. Maybe... You thought this way in the past, but if you're honest, you've been your own Lord. You've been your own little Caesar in your bedroom for many, many years. And you need to come back. C says, I want to consider this a bit more first. And please hear this. If you're a C, I'm so glad that you're here. One of the goals of this church is to have many C's in this room to consider the things about Jesus that are preached. I'm so glad that you're here and we're here to help. The box D says, I don't ever intend on making that decision. And that's okay if you check that. 
It really is. I'm so glad that, that you're here. But it's important to know the decision that you're making. And here's also a good deal. I've known a great many D's who next year will be a B. And I think it's important just to admit that to yourself. And here's the deal. You're like, okay, what's going to happen with these check boxes? This week, we're going to reach out to the B's and the C's and offer help. Offer to help you begin a relationship with Jesus, connect you with a person who's been following Jesus for a while, and maybe it's just to consider, maybe it's just to check it out, maybe it's just to answer some questions. We want to be here to help you. So we're going to take 30 seconds just to give you an opportunity to check one of those boxes, and then after that, the hospitality team is going to pass around the buckets, and you can just drop everything into there. So take a moment and consider and check a box and i'll be i'll be back in a minute